It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Houck, episode 29, How to Navigate Diversity Issues in Improv Communities to Increase Your Acting Opportunities, with Keisha Zoller. It's the Acting Income Podcast with Ben Houck. Turn your passion into income, Ben will show you how. With all the resources that you need to make it as a Welcome to the Acting Income Podcast. I'm Ben Houck, and on this weekly podcast, we dig deeply into important topics related to acting, making money, and balancing it all. Many thanks for pushing play. And if you're new to the podcast and haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Pull up iTunes or your podcast's app and click the subscribe button. You'll get new episodes as they come out each week. This is episode 29, titled, How to Navigate Diversity Issues in Improv Communities to Increase Your Acting Opportunities, with Keisha Zoller. The show notes for this episode have all the important links referenced in today's show, which you can pull up right now at actingincome.com slash episode 29. And now, here's a word from today's sponsor, my book, Long Form Improv. In my book, Long Form Improv, The Complete Guide to Creating Characters, Sustaining Scenes, and Performing Extraordinary Heralds, I teach improv from the perspective of game theory. I argue that an improvised scene is a two-person strategic interaction in which both characters are trying to get what they want, and the solution of that scene is a win-win outcome. That simple way of seeing improv scenes has immense power, making it common sense where to edit scenes, how to support improvisers, and what's the difference between a character saying no and an actor saying no. It's a logic about improv that blew my mind so i wrote a book about it you can get my book long form improv the book with the bright red cover also available on kindle and nook by visiting actingincome.com slash lfi that's actingincome.com slash lfi in the year 2000 i first took improv classes at the upright citizens brigade theater in new york city it was a very exciting time in my life filled with tons of laughs and happy memories Back then, I saw a number of improvisers perform who would become wealthy comedy stars of today. I was a frequent attendee of Herald Night, which, if you don't know, was a weekly show with packed audiences, which featured teams of about seven improvisers creating half-hour improvised shows based on a single audience suggestion. On the whole, these shows were riotous. So frequently could these performers pull off hilarious shows without knowing what they were going to do beforehand that it kept me going back week after week. The UCB Theater was not just a performance venue, but it was also an improv training school, and it's since evolved into an expansive program. It's even served as a sort of farm for comedy talent. It's a very competitive culture, and there are only so many performance spots available to students who take classes there, and it's the performance spots that students so covet, because with them comes prestige and visibility. So what happens if you put a school into an ethnically diverse community such as NYC, let it expand, and tie its performance opportunities to professional acting opportunities? Well, one answer could be that you get an ethnically diverse improv community with everyone more or less having the same performance and professional opportunities. Or not. And if you don't get that ethnically diverse improv community, why not? And what does that mean for an ethnic diversity of people getting professional acting opportunities? Can anything be done? My guest today is Keisha Zoller, and we tackle that very topic. Keisha is an actor and comedian who teaches improv at the UCB Theater, and she's also worked on diversity issues at the UCB. I say diversity issues at the UCB because I became aware of them by way of a September 2015 article in the Washington Post on that very topic. Keisha was cited in that article, and so was a student performer who had quit the UCB because of what she perceived as long-standing discrimination at the school and a lack of care for black people and minorities. So today we're talking about these issues. There's a lot to unpack, and I'm grateful Keisha agreed to the interview because, as you can tell by the interview, she speaks very well on this topic. Here's her bio. Keisha Zoller is an actor, writer, and comedian. She's been seen on Orange is the New Black, The Today Show, College Humor, Comedy Central, MTV, UCB Comedy, and numerous web series. She can be seen performing around New York City at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater and the People's Improv Theater. Keisha also performs regularly with her UCB Herald team and is a member of Doppelganger with Sashir Zameda and Nicole Byer. She also co-hosts The Soul Glow Project, 
a podcast celebrating comedy and inclusion. A quick reminder that the show notes for this episode have links to items referenced in this interview. You can pull them up at actingincome.com slash episode 29. And now, here's my interview with Keisha Zoller. Keisha Zoller, welcome to the Acting Income Podcast. Hi, how's it going, Ben? We've already been chit-chatting before this interview, and I wanted to say that I'm very excited to have you on. I found out about this topic because of an article that I alluded to in the intro to this episode from the Washington Post, talking about diversity problems at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York City. And you were quoted in that article. This podcast talks about issues related to actors and income. And I'm guessing that if actors are experiencing problems with diversity, they're not able to have some of the same opportunities. So I wanted to have you on the podcast to talk about diversity problems and what might be done about that. Now, you're affiliated with the Upright Citizen Brigade, and I understand that your perspectives are not necessarily of the Upright Citizen Brigade Theater, but your own. And so could you tell me a little bit about your relationship with the Upright Citizen Brigade Theater and with improv and acting in general? I first moved to New York when I was about 21. I got my MFA in acting. After I got my MFA, I realized I wanted to perform comedy and pursue comedy. I just went down that track and did a lot of short form improv. Then I started taking classes at the Upright Citizens Brigade. I enjoyed my classes. This was around 2006. But I felt so alone because I felt like there was no one who looked like me and no one who shared experiences similar to mine. So I actually quit for a few years. I did a bunch of indie, underground, weird, experimental improv. And then... I came back to UCB and got very involved in the diversity program and at becoming the diversity coordinator at the Upright Citizens Brigade. Right now, I'm currently a teacher. I'm on a team and have another show that it looks like we're probably going to get a run. My relationship to UCB is very interesting because they are where I get some of my income. I also teach at Sarah Lawrence College. I'm helping to develop and build their comedy program with an awesome group of students who are so diverse that it makes me happy. When people talk about diversity, it's not a second thought for me. So where does that belief in diversity come from in your life? I've always been interested in different perspectives. I believe that the human existence is an intricate web of complex experiences and that truth is subjective individually, and we can create these beautiful narratives and find deeper meaning when we utilize each other. When we utilize each other, we're able to find deeper connections in the experience and create richer narratives. I don't remember a time in my life where I thought diversity wasn't important. On that point, you have what sounds to me a privileged perspective about diversity. You were not only the diversity coordinator at UCB, no longer current, as I understand. Yes. You also worked within the improv community in general, not just as the UCB, but also outside of UCB. Yeah. And then you also teach at Sarah Lawrence. You teach students of a diverse background. So you've seen somewhat less diverse communities work, and you've seen more diverse communities work. So let me bring this back to what was your data day as a diversity coordinator when you were at the Upright Citizen Brigade Theater. Help me understand what you did and what kinds of tasks you handled. It wasn't a day-to-day -day thing because I wasn't employed. It was a work-study slash internship opportunity. How I lived my life while I was in that position was very nuanced and interesting. A lot of times it wasn't that there was work for me to do every day because, again, I had to work other jobs to be able to do diversity. I really tried to make myself an ally and a place where students could come talk to me and process all their feelings. I still try to make myself open and aware to people who are having a challenging time or who are having a good time. And I understand that it's hard to work through comedy in general. So when you bring the real world oppression that exists into this conversation, it changes it in another way. What are some of the concerns and problems and issues students brought up to you when you were working as a diversity coordinator? Not feeling represented, feeling that other students were potentially putting them in uncomfortable positions. I'm going to point to someone who was very public, my friend Danae. 
she actually wrote a Tumblr post about her feelings on diversity within the community, and you can find it online. I'll put a link in the show notes to it. Diversity in every sense. What I mean by that is there were people of color, for sure. There are people in the LGBTQ plus community who also had issues. There are people who were over the age of 35 who had issues. People who in this conversation are intersectional. If you're an older woman of color, or if you're someone who doesn't identify in the gender binary and you're over 35, you're going to feel very isolated. And those are some of the things that I was hearing. And I hear from the larger improv community, not just UCB, but genuinely the larger improv community. And I've always heard this. When it came to be the diversity coordinator at UCBT, you listened to problems from students. What kind of responsibilities did you take on and what kind of action did you take or could you take when hearing these problems? One of the things I did as diversity coordinator, I helped to restructure how scholarships were given out. And it took it from 16 four-class scholarships to restructuring it so more students were able to take one or two classes to see if they liked it, to see if UCB is a good fit for them. And as a result, more students would apply and more students would receive the opportunity. Sometimes students don't need a full ride. They just need some help. There was also opportunities for STEM students to get full rides, which I was really happy about. However, I think it's important to give as many people the opportunity to see if this is a good fit. One of the things I'm very proud about is opening that aspect of the diversity program up and also including meetups in that. One of the things I really pushed for when I started was to have face-to-face contact with other people who identified as diverse and open it up to the larger community. I think it's important for everyone to hear those issues, not just people who are struggling with similar issues. There are practical implications to a whole diversity of voices speaking at the same time. If that happens, it's a cacophony and it's hard to get anything done. So you have to rein it in a bit. And that's a delicate balance because I imagine if you have people who feel as if their voices are marginalized and they're marginalized in a meeting where they are trying to speak about their marginalized voice, it just makes it more of a powder keg. Let's segue now from talk of your work as a diversity coordinator. You mentioned that you want to see richer narratives on stage. And to achieve that goal, you want to have a more diverse profile of people on stage. The presumption being if you see people of different races or different cultures represented on stage, with that comes different voices. Now, someone might argue that everyone has a different voice. Everyone has a unique voice. Why is one group or one individual's voice important enough to be put on that stage? What makes someone's voice important enough to be represented? And what makes someone's maybe not as important? This is where I'm going to have to go back to history. One of the things people talk about when they try to say individualization, well, why isn't a group of white people? We're individuals too. It goes back to representation. It goes back to systemic oppression. It goes back to the fact there are people who feel unsafe. Because there's not space for them in the media. And when it is, it's usually painting them in a negative light or not as dynamic as their experience actually is. Or that they aren't allowed to be as messy and strange and weird as they could be. The realistic thing is there's a lack of authentic representation in many positions. The real world demographics and the representation we see in media and entertainment, there's a huge radical disconnect. And so, yes, everyone is an individual. It's hard to see people as individuals when they're not being portrayed accurately in terms of their representations, even close to statistically. Within the African-American or the Black diaspora, There's so many nuanced voices, and I'll pull this back to a personal example. My improv team, Astronomy Club, who also does sketch, we, in many ways, represent a nice aspect of the Black diaspora. Could you explain what you mean by Black diaspora? The wide-ranging experiences and cultures and backgrounds and how we've been spread out the Black experience. There are people on Astronomy Club who aren't of African-American descent. There are people who are not even American on the team. People see an all-Black team and they assume we have the same Black experience. 
when people look at all white teens, they assume they probably have the same experience. When you have so many spaces that we aren't celebrating diversity, people start to get washed. When you're talking about individualization, it's usually a sense of, well, white people get to be diverse types and minorities get one or two. The metaphors I sometimes throw out there, it's like, you know, everybody for a while was all about Zach Galifianakis. Where's the Asian version of Zach Galifianakis? If we're typing in the industry, why don't we get to see the vast diversity of performers who internally have these specificities and they bring their culture to this specific time of comedy versus Zach Galifianakis, quote unquote, types tend to only be white. Do we care about race or do we not care about race? Maybe you could just clarify that. It's not do we not care about race or do we care about race? It's from the beginning, the American narrative has been skewed to favor certain groups' voices as more important, as more strong, and more individualized. If you look at our history, that is the way our narrative has been structured. Now we are trying to be more inclusive. In that, we have to really question the voices that came before. We're saying, well, look at all these other individuals. They were allowed to potentially be individuals because we didn't have other voices. To really allow everybody's voice to be individualized, we actually have to give greater representation to the real demographics of the U.S. Well, this is where I get confused. And I'm guessing that other people who are listening to this get a little confused. Because I asked about race and then you spoke of voice. Are we talking about a diversification of races? Are we talking about a diversification of voices? Are we saying that race and voice are intertwined and we need to respect that? Or are we saying that we just need a diversification of voices and then everyone's voice speaks? The system has been rigged to oppress certain voices. You can speak to women, you can speak to people of color, you can speak to sexual orientation. And within those marginalized communities of race, gender, beyond, People have developed their own voices to deal with oppression, to deal with their own narratives, and sometimes created their own art based on that. And society has not necessarily included those voices as meaningful, that even within communities, there's individualized voices. If you look at this Afro-punk movement in music, it's an alternative voice to say jazz, to say hip-hop. And it's a voice that's still grounded in racial and cultural aspects. It's hard because it's not a simple conversation as voice and race. There's this thing of race and there's many voices in race. However, I as a black woman personally feel I'm not allowed to have my own nuanced voice within the larger conversation of race because my voice turns into the default black voice and I get homogenized as black. Anecdotally, I've talked about it. I'm actually much more neurotic and awkward and weird. And I love that about me. However, I don't see that vastly represented amongst black voices in quote unquote mainstream cinema. When we talk about voice versus culture, the way I process it, and this is my personal process, is one of the dangerous things when we just look at as, oh, I guess we need more black people. What tends to happen when we have the just general, oh, we need more black people, we think about hiring the same kind of black person. Or we think about hiring black people that fit a narrative we're comfortable with that doesn't really explore that there's a lot of diversity within black culture. But because the entire black culture in America is so marginalized, a lot of America doesn't take the time to see it because they don't know enough black people to know that there's a larger culture to it. And when I say enough people, I mean white people specifically. I can point to the numbers that there's not enough people who are engaging with diverse black people to know that there's actual diversity in the black experience or the Asian experience or the queer experience, et cetera. When it comes to creating the Acting Income podcast, diversity has been important to me from the beginning. I've wanted to represent a diversity of voices. When it comes down to it, I've looked at male and female voices, and I've specifically thought to at least alternate them. If I have a couple female voices on from week to week, I want to get a male perspective in there. 
It's not that it's all about male and female. It's about a diversity of voices for me. And I haven't looked at the race issue specifically. I suppose this might be the first time we've talked about race. The challenge that has come for me is that there's limitations. There's limitations on my time. From week to week, generating a meaningful podcast is tough. And my resources, access to persons of color, I'm not able to access them in the time that I need to put out an episode. So I'm wondering how those personal lessons that I've had in producing this kind of work apply to, say, an improv community or an acting community. Is intending to be diverse enough or does it actually have to happen for a production or a performance community to be counted as diverse? One of the things that happens without the intentionality and follow through on diversity initiatives and really trying to make this idea of diversity and inclusion meaningful, communities default to the norm, whatever norm is in that community, without taking specific action and holding ourselves accountable to that action, communities revert to whatever's typical or the typical power structures that are mirrored in the larger society. Is it If a community tries to be more diverse and it's accepted that trying is enough, then that's all they'll do instead of trying harder and trying harder to be more diverse? Trying harder and following through. One of the things I keep hearing in how I read about diversity is that there's a weird conversation that people worry so hard about getting it wrong that I think sometimes people would rather see someone get it wrong, have it be messy, and we all learn from it and go back to the drawing board and try again and follow through. In that way, we can start to make meaningful progress. However, I think we get lost in the development phase, in the ideation phase so much that we end up not doing it. So we think about diversity, but it's not actually executed. Right. And, and people get busy and we have to put on a show. and We have to do it now. And, you know, it goes by the wayside. I guess I can understand it from a practical standpoint. But if it's important to you, you really got to keep on top of yourself to make a diverse group of performers, diverse performances, etc. And one of the things I have many conversations about, we talk about how it is exhausting to have these conversations. And if you really start to read about diversity, you hear how exhausted diverse voices are. I'll be honest, I say it to my husband, who is a wonderful white man all the time. I'm exhausted from talking about this. It's not that I don't want to talk about this because it is important. It is my voice and the voice of people I care about and I respect who are being silenced. I'm exhausted because it's emotional. I'm exhausted because it's so much bigger than me. However, I don't get to check out of it. I don't get to tap out because I look like this. This is my experience. I feel the day-to-day -day institutionalized racism. I don't get to tap out because it is my life. And one of the hard parts is if you are of the majority of a society, if you are of the predominantly white perspective and you come from an economically advantaged place, you can check out of it. You can take a break from it and make excuses as to why you're not being more active in diversity. But when you're a person of color, when you're a woman, when you identify as something else other than male or female, or you're over 45, et cetera, you don't get to tap out of your own life. I hear you. You said something earlier about something to the effect of the product of having a marginalized voice is the creation of different kinds of art, different products. When you were talking about Afropunk was one example. I have felt like a marginalized voice in my life. In the improv community, I felt like a marginalized voice. And the product of that was a book on improv. It's not the same kind of marginalization that you're talking about. I don't have to wake up as a woman, as a black woman, and then not be able to shed that. I'm a white male. But I did feel marginalized after continually trying to be recognized. It's an unfortunate burden, I suppose you could say, imposed upon people who are marginalized. They have to work that much harder. That said, it's not quite a beauty, but I'm excited that there are marginalized voices because it leads to, for some people, I want to say more fire, more energy to get out works and to create things that are exciting for the audience, the richer entertainment. Mm -hmm. At least that's where I'm coming from. And I'm basing that on what you're saying as well. Think about it this way, that fiery entertainment, think about how much more fiery and nuanced it would be if it already had a space. 
think about how much more interesting it would be if it didn't have to come from oppression. And I do believe that there would be an interesting, still powerful kind of art if people didn't have to get up and over. The art that is created from that pain, that beauty, that oppression, and I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but that art that's created is amazing. And I think to myself, what would those artists do if they got to have back the time and energy of all that oppression, of all that marginalization, and put it to new forms of art, new ways of thinking of the world? I can't even fathom what that might look like. And for me, this is where we could be. That's where we could go to, which is why diversity and inclusion is important. There's so much energy and anxiety, and I don't want to say it's wasted. I just wonder what would happen if we rechanneled it. I think something beautiful could happen. Let's segue this conversation a bit toward... How do we address diversity more specifically? How do we even solve the problem? I want to think back to the UCB, the Upright Citizen Brigade, the group, the actual improv group. They were founded by a small group of people, and they eventually went on to found a school that has grown to a training center that has been perhaps the ultimate training center to learn about improvisation. When does diversity become a concern for an improv group getting together? If I wanted to start an improv group today with a few friends, do I care about diversity at this point? Or do I care about it if I decide to graduate and teach other people our methods? I think it's hard to say what other people should do. I can only speak to how I live my life. Whatever you want to create in terms of your artistic field is great. However, when you are in a position where you're creating opportunities for others, are you just trying to create opportunities for people who look like you? Or are you trying to create opportunities for people who care about what you care about? And that's different. Is the presumption that when people create groups, that they include the people they look like and exclude the people they don't resemble? Here's the real truth. It depends on how much unconscious bias they have. Unconscious bias is real. Some people actively want to create diverse groups. Some people actively are just going with the people they think are funny, which may resemble their ethnic age, orientation, gender background. And I'm not saying you can't do either. I don't know where these decisions come from for the individual. All I can do is point to numbers and systemic issues. I'm not living in anyone else's shoes. I don't know the best way to start an improv group because there's not a right way to start an improv group. I just know that unconscious bias is real. That when we look at the real world and we look at the comedy community at large, all the issues that are in the comedy community are mirrors to the real world. And that I think there's a feeling that we're in a creative field, so we must be more sensitive. Therefore, we don't have the real world issues that exist. I think that is false. A hundred percent false. The moment you go after any endeavor, you become the mirrors of the greater society. You are not detached from it. I don't know why someone in a Fortune 500 company would choose a white male candidate. Just the same way, I don't know why someone in an improv class would choose a white male teammate in that moment. I don't know why, and I would like to think it's not from a place of malice. However, I do think it's important to ask that person why. You know what you make me think? You make me think that if we have unconscious biases and we don't ask ourselves whether we have them, if we don't become aware of our own biases, let's say I'm a white guy and I want to form an improv group and I choose white guy, white guy, white guy, and then we go on to teach and it's white guy, white guy, white guy in there. And then those people go on to teach and they're teaching white guy, white guy, white guy. At what point should I have asked myself whether I have a bias? Because it certainly looks as if I must have a bias. It's almost as if my thoughts populate and my population may reflect my bias if I am not aware of my own bias. It may be that the population is telling me that I have a bias that I'm not aware of. That may not be absolutely true. That might be BS, but I think that there's a case to be said. And I think that even goes back to what we're talking about, this diversity issue in the UCB community or perhaps in improv in general. How I look at it is everybody should be looking at their unconscious bias from the beginning. Once you start to open that part of yourself up, you start realizing you can't go back and maybe you do start making different decisions. 
then maybe you're making this decision, white guy, white guy, white woman, Latin woman, or white guy, white guy, black guy, black woman, and you're just changing your decisions. And maybe you make yourself more open because you realize, oh, my unconscious bias didn't make me want to laugh at this because I always felt uncomfortable when X, Y, and Z was talked about. I think it's okay because I also think it's okay that if people have shared experiences and they want to form an improv team, great, form an improv team. I'm not against that. It's how conscious of you are of that shared experience as you're creating an improv team or you defaulting to an all white structure. And I worry that it's the latter, that people are just defaulting because there's no thought put into, am I having any sort of intentionality or mindfulness as I create these spaces. When it comes to scripted work, sometimes commercial demands dictate that you'd want to have people of certain races represented in the cast. When it comes to improv, at least the kind of improv that we're talking about, the worlds are pantomimed. So you can play anything or invent anything. So it seems to me that when it comes to representing people on stage and diversity, there's an especially strong case to making sure that the improv stage is diverse because there's no obligation that, say, a white character that comes into a scene needs to be played by a white improviser or a black character needs to be played by a black improviser or a dog character needs to be played by a dog. You can play anything. Does that parallel any of your teachings when it comes? You teach improvisation. How do you teach diversity in improvisation? I just try to remind people from the moment you step on stage, you can be anything. And I should be allowed to be anything. I'm trying to get better at this. I say all of this knowing I am not 100% competent and that there are things I do that undermine equality and fairness. And I actively try to get better. I'm not perfect. I will say this right now. I would hope that no one would expect themselves perfect, but that they have room to grow, perhaps a lot of room to grow or even a little bit rather than thinking, oh, I got it all. I mastered this diversity topic. I feel that pressure that people are like, well, you talk about diversity, so therefore you have mastered it and you have the solutions. And I was like, far from it. I'm just trying to make myself more open and realize that I need to change my language to the point where I, as a teacher, am trying to be more open with unconscious bias. Like if a woman is being put in many, many traditional gender stereotyped roles, I try to say, hey, class, let's open ourselves up and not do that. If a person of color is being put in stereotypical roles, I try to open up the class and say, hey, class, let's not do that because unconscious bias is real. And I try to say things like unconscious bias is real. I mirror that sentiment as an improv teacher. If I see an improviser doing similar choices over and over and over again, I might give the direction instead of don't do that. I might say, avoid doing that. Try this instead essentially trying to take them in a different direction. They're allowed to go in that direction, but I want to expand their creativity rather than getting fixated on a certain subject matter or topic. The thing I try to use in the conversation is what's amazing about improv is you can look at me and see a black woman who's about five foot eight. However, I can be a dragon. I can be a dog. I can be anything. I can play against my gender, my age, everything. So please respect that. One of the reasons you see more all female groups, all POC groups, people of color groups, any other sort of group where they identify in some similar way coming together. The reason they love them is there's an understanding that they get to step on stage and there's less assumption that they are what they are. I can speak to my experience to be more clear about that. When I am playing with my improv team astronomy club, or a doppelganger. I know I can step on stage and literally be anything that people aren't presupposing about my race, gender, age, sexuality, any of that. I know that people aren't and that I get to control what I present on stage. It's not controlling as in I'm trying to dominate the scene, but control as in my default isn't a black woman. You know, in improv, there's group mind, that concept of group mind. I see group mind as the group thinking spontaneously all the same. Now, that sounds dangerous in light of this topic of diversity, but you're not talking about that. You're talking about almost as if your group has the same value system and you know that it must feel extraordinary 
knowing when you step on that stage that you guys are thinking alike and you're not going to find yourself marginalized or humiliated by the other people in your team. Yeah. And I think that's really it. How do you create spaces where anybody feels like they can step on stage and be anything and you aren't looking at them and going, well, they're Asian. Where do Asian people live? And not even that it's conscious, but that you have any of those thoughts. I'll go back to a doppelganger example because I'm not afraid to blow this person up. We did a show and we're three black women, Nicole Byer, Sashir Zameda, and myself, doppelganger. And we ask for a suggestion and someone yells out Destiny's Child because we're three black women. Very lovingly, the audience reacted, which tells me about the space we are moving towards by booing that person. Afterwards, that same person came up to us and said, well, if I didn't say Destiny's Child, I would have said the Supremes and just started listing other black female groups. And we were like, oh, you don't get it. Give us anything. We can be anything. And the reason the audience booed you is here's a magical art form where these performers are going to be anything. Why do you have to limit them before the show even starts? <laughs> You know, you make me think of the improv teaching of going from A to C and you have this audience member who probably based on his or her experience, it was going from A to B <laughs> and you want the person to jump over that first reaction and get to C because it's much more interesting. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we won't bring our experiences into it. It was just so uncomfortable because it felt like, please be the black things I expect you to be by putting that label on us. You're literally saying, my opinion of black women is this very narrow focus. Please adhere to my very narrow focus, which is infuriating. <laughs> and it connects back to this whole topic of diversity. We want richer experiences on stage so we can tell richer narratives, so the audience can be informed, so that they're not saying Destiny's Child when asking for a suggestion, but they're asking for something else. Keisha Zoller, I want to know if you have anything more you want to share with the Acting Income Podcast audience. Diversity in many ways starts with you questioning your own thoughts, your own bias, your own privilege, and then making sure you're making the choices you want to make with intentionality. We can all have a bit more intentionality and openness. When someone says something, especially if they are a part of a marginalized group, try to listen before you react. There's this wonderful Huffington Post article I read a friend sent to me. That said, she, as a white woman, understands how much pain it is to be called a racist. But the thing you have to understand, it hurts way more to be the person who experiences racism. That marginalization hurts way more than being called bigoted. And that if people can understand that being called bigoted may hurt your feelings, however, the other person probably hurts way more and we should have some empathy towards that. Again, it's not perfect. We're all working towards better. However, I think we can all check our unconscious bias and our privilege. Keisha Zoller, thanks for talking to the Acting Income Podcast. Thanks. It strikes me from this interview, well, a lot of things. One is that diversity is a value. It's something that people like Keisha Zoller have valued pretty much all their lives. But not all people value diversity right out of the womb. Some people will come to value it as their lives unfold. Some won't. Maybe ever. Question becomes, what happens to a community when diversity is not held as a core value? Well, I think we can agree what happens when diversity is held as a core value. You get a community that keeps on top of itself to make sure it is diverse and keeps trying to recognize where voices might be getting oppressed and need expression. And you get a community that's going to see the value of diversity unquestionably, and thus value a multitude of voices, perspectives, experiences, backgrounds, ideas, and so on, rather than just a few. And you also see that some people just need to be taught the value of diversity so that they can recognize its value on their own, and so that they can make changes in their choices to awaken themselves to the profits of diversity in their lives. 
Keisha goes a long way, in my opinion, toward providing a case for diversity. There are a lot of nuanced positions in this world. What can you do with improv to support that belief? How lazy is it to pimp another improviser into a stereotype rather than a countertype? I guess this makes me think that the biggest enemy of valuing diversity is valuing laziness, which might be understandable because, as Keisha expresses, fighting for diversity is exhausting. But I guess I want to say this. If laziness is devalued in the culture, might diversity have a better chance? But let's not forget there's no culture or institution or school or community at play here. There are people, and people do things, not communities. I'd like to conclude with a short poem by Martin H. Levinson, which I heard recently at a conference on general semantics. It's titled, People Do. Institutions don't act. People do. Fact? Nations don't fight. People do. Right? Organizations don't queue. People do. True? Courts don't grant stays. People do. Okay? Schools don't neglect. People do. Correct? Religions don't preach. People do. Capiche? Moral of the story. People do. In categories. If you can get down from the community level and down to the people level and figure out who is responsible and affect the people who are responsible, you may have positioned yourself better for practical change. Thanks to Marty Levinson for letting me include his poem in the show. And of course, thanks again to Keisha Zoller. And that's the show. This episode was sponsored by Longform Improv, the complete guide to creating characters, sustaining scenes, and performing extraordinary heralds by Ben Houck. To purchase a copy of Longform Improv, also available in Kindle and Nook, visit actingincome.com slash LFI. The show notes for this episode are available at actingincome.com slash episode 29, where you can also leave a comment on this episode. You can also find Acting Income on Twitter and Facebook. If you'd like to pitch an episode idea, visit actingincome.com slash pitch. If you'd like to sponsor an episode, visit actingincome.com slash advertise. And if you love the content of this podcast, share your love with a review of this podcast on iTunes at actingincome.com slash iTunes. I'm Ben Houck, and for more information, as always, check out actingincome.com.